inviting me to be part of this uh, event. It's really great. I've really been looking forward to this. It's a privilege to be up here with this panel. And thanks for the uh, thanks to the New School for Social Research for, for putting this on. It's really great. Um, perhaps the single most important achievement in the sociology of knowledge over the last half century has been to problematize um, the whole notion that social progress is driven by the great ideas that are contained within the great books that are written by society's greatest thinkers. Um, so it seems to me it's a little bit, not just a little bit, quite a bit ironic that um, we owe this achievement in no small part to the great ideas contained within the very great book, The Social Construction of Reality, written by two very great thinkers, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman. Um, at the heart, then, of, I'm going to call social construction of reality score. At the heart of SCORE's intervention is a shift from the history of rarefied ideas to the analysis of practical knowledge, or as they state it, to exaggerate the importance of theoretical thought in society and history is a natural failing of theorizers. The sociology of knowledge must first of all concern itself with what people know is reality in their everyday non, -pre non or pre-theoretical lives. So this move has yielded a lot of scholarly fruit. It's provided the catalyst for transitioning the sociology of knowledge away from a sort of um, esoteric domain within German philosophy of science and sociology, and it's become fundamental to several of the most productive areas of contemporary social research, from cultural sociology to science and technology studies. But despite these dividends, um, it seems to me that the flip side of SCORE's methodological summons has been largely neglected. How do we develop a sense of shared unreality? The sociology of knowledge that followed SCORE has had a tendency to follow the parts that imply that dreams, delusions, and other what they called finite provinces of meanings or marginal realities can be cordoned off from the paramount reality of everyday life. So, for example, we have studies on faulty evaluation, false beliefs, denial, false consciousness, on illness, criminality, and other forms of deviant identity, on rejected knowledge like parapsychology or paranormal science. Um, and what I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that there's anything inherently wrong with any of this type of work. Um, I just think that in, as, a, as a whole, we've kind of neglected how everyday experiences can and often do oscillate between a sense of the real or a sense of reality and less reality as a matter of course. All right, so it seems to me that we can think of less reality as a kind of imminent possibility that constitutes everyday social life rather than a deviation that threatens it. I make this point mostly through illustration, I'm going to today, some from my own ethnographic research, but largely drawing on secondary work. Um, my paper then is going to be organized, my talk will briefly talk about three areas in which less reality is sort of mobilized in practical action. First, the way simulations prepare um, uh, skilled practitioners for uncertain, risky, or high consequence tasks. Um, second, the institution of experiment and experimentalism to gain epistemic knowledge of one form or another. And then third, autotelic. Uh, or transcendent social experience, experience for its own sake. No way I'm going to have time to talk about any of these with length, so I'm just going to sort of throw them out there just so you all get a sense of how I'm thinking about this. All right. all right, so in a key empirical area for thinking about less reality and practical action is in the training of skilled practitioners. So here we find simulation techniques and other mock scenarios that relax the potential consequences of engaging in an event that's highly uncertain high risk or that seldom occurs. So in the language of the organizational theorist James March, simulations are one way that groups cope with problems related to stingy or thin experience. They provide a rough and ready approximation of events that don't often occur but are important when they do. Examples are really not hard to find once you start thinking about it like this. Simulations have been studied in competitive sports, medical education, military training, disaster prevention and risk, um, uh, or disaster prevention and risk analysis, and safety engineering. We can even think of examples that are pretty close to home. Home cooks often um, uh, rehearse new recipes before preparing them for an important dinner guest. 
An underlying mechanism of this form of less reality is that the higher the risk of a consequential event or the less successful, accessible it is to um, routine experience, the more elaborate are the simulations, mock scenarios, and other forms of less reality used to prepare for its potentiality. So in my own study of amateur boxing in Chicago, everyday life was organized around a series of simulations that became more varied and complex as members of the program rose up the group's status hierarchy. And you know the fact that you can't see that those little things covering their eyes aren't actually readable. Um, uh, initiates were only allowed to practice by punching phantom heads and bodies, shadow boxing in front of mirrors. Eventually, boxers graduated to hitting the dead flesh of leather punching bags. This enabled them to punch air and leather and coordinate their movements across a wider expanse of the gym floor. But it was only after several months of working through these air and leather simulations that boxers gained access to live human flesh in the form of full contact sparring. Even here, though, the coaching staff would choreograph drills and regularly remind boxers that your sparring partner is your friend, this is not a real fight. And even competitive matches tended to get translated back into what you might think of as a kind of omnivorous simulation order. The coach might say, don't worry about that fight, man. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that you lost. Next time when you get hit like that, you ain't even going to blink. Other studies that have raised, other studies of less reality have raised pretty interesting issues around the combination of physical and virtual modalities of the technique. Uh, so, for example, surgical training using smart mannequins um, has been studied nicely by Rachel Prentice and Erica Johnson. Um, and they point to, it that a key, point to the fact that a key shortcoming of many virtual surgical simulators has been their inability to reproduce an appropriate sensitivity to the tactile feel and the olfactory engagement necessary for a skilled surgeon to cut through different forms of live body tissue. So for most of the 20th century, this was done with lengthy apprenticeship with master surgeons and through vivisection of, action, of dead bodies. Surgical simulators designed over the last decade two decades roughly, attempt to streamline the, the apprenticeship process and close the reality gap with synthetic organs that look, respond, and even smell like living tissue. Okay, now this last example kind of raises another related but I think distinct way that less reality gets mobilized in practical action as a way of gaining new knowledge. So it seems to me that the institution of ex laboratory experiment is the quintessential example here, which is based on the principle that methodological design and instrumentation can capture, constrain, isolate, and then modify the complexity of naturally occurring phenomena. So I'm going to draw a little bit on Bruno Latour here and his empirical work on laboratory experiment. He documents the interpretive and material sort of tacking back and forth between what you might think of as a world-removed lab and a world-weary while, a kind of simultaneous mobilization of natural artifice and constructed nature. Consider a study of Pasteur's work to cultivate the anthrax bacillus. <coughs> Pasteur first moved his lab to a farm in order to identify the bacteria that were killing cattle. His second move was then to take the bacteria back to his lab at the AMS in Paris to create an artificial environment where it might thrive even more readily than it was on the farms. This translation between every, the everyday wilds of naturally producing or naturally occurring phenomenon to the artificially cultivated habitat or microcosmos of the lab and then back again creates a displacement in what's considered outside and what gets considered inside. So what begins as a controlled and obviously less real conditions of the laboratory and scientific experiment are made the primary seat of knowledge um, for the reality that's occurring on the farms and within the bodies of the cows. Latour states, where everyone fails because the scale is too large, Pasteur succeeds because he works on a small scale. The translation is now the following. If you wish to understand epidemics, you have one place to go, Pasteur's laboratory, and one science to learn that will soon replace yours, microbiology. So it's precisely through the experiment's ability to mobilize less reality that the farm is displaced as the primary site for the production and epistemology of anthrax. Only after this reality inversion occurs can the subsequent reality of inoculated farm animals be established. Then there's other ways, of course, not just science, 
that less reality gets mobilized towards the production of new knowledge. So take, for example, the uptick in popularity of what's called unbuilt architecture or unbuilt projects. So cottage industry sort of offers several different awards at the local and national level for architectural plans that were commissioned but and seemingly are realistic uh, or re could be realistically realized but never were. So there's lots of these, um, uh, but there's these wonderful, beautifully illustrated uh, table books and various museum exhibitions for these plants. Um, and so while the designs provide beauty for casual browsing, they're all, and they're surely used in this way, the collections also get mobilized for more serious social purposes. Take a collection like Never Built Los Angeles, which provides a con almost a funeral-themed imaginary of what Los Angeles could have been how, were it not for the, quote, reluctant city whose institutions, citizens, politics, and infrastructure, not to mention its sheer size, have often undermined inspired urban schemes. The authors then comment on the array of work that collections of the unbuilt can do. They say that the stories surrounding these projects tell us what it is about Los Angeles that causes bold architectural efforts to founder. They also shed light on the frustrations of building in general, in which turning dreams into reality requires an almost impossible mixture of civic will, financial luck, and boundless perseverance. Rising out of this narrative of thwarted goals is a catalog of virtuoso drawings and renderings that on a visceral level ignite the imagination, painting an unmistakable picture of a city that might have been and still could be. So the text points towards four ways in which the unrealized architectural projects serve practical action. First, they provide an empirical substrate for a kind of lay sociology of failure. Architects and designers play the role here of reluctant heroes. Second, they serve as a kind of distributed funeral rite for expressing a shared sense of shared loss over what was once obtainable but is now an unbuilt future. Third, books like this serve as a kind of repository to ignite the imagination with renewed hope for the future. And then finally, not, a, not just a little like Pasteur's bacteria farming, collections and exhibits of unbuilt projects attempt to raise public consciousness around the infrastructure that's needed to sustain a vibrant design and artistic ecosystem. And in this way, they've been picked up quite a bit by um, uh, various uh, art worlds as well. All right, last example. Mobilizing less reality for auto tea liquor transcending experience. So the main examples I have here are kind of immersive play, such as video gaming or other forms of shared fantasy. I'm also thinking about technological mediations like augmented reality, though. What holds this together are those experiences of, of less, or I suspect we could probably argue more reality, that focus on pleasurable experience for its own sake, not for some other end, like constraining risk or producing knowledge. So take augmented reality. These are widely available on smartphones now and tablets. They can also be packaged with smart glasses. And most recently, they're going to be coming soon as smart contacts. Um, Google, Google announced earlier this year that they're partnering with the multinational um, pharmaceutical corporation Novartis uh, with uh, the explicit and notably altruistic motive of helping diabetes patients better monitor their glucose levels by measuring um, uh, their levels of their tear ducts uh, using the contacts. These technologies also explicitly seek, though, to enhance social sphere experience in and of itself, and are, of course, deeply bound up with attempts to infiltrate subjectivity with advertising and marketing employees. But they do this in a particular sort of way, I think, that explicitly plays with oscillations between what's the real, the less real, and the more real. So, you take this prototype of what a augmented reality looks like. Um, it directly interfaces with our with with our perceptual senses with virtual inputs. Street directions can be displayed, reviews of nearby restaurants, flicker images recently taken in the area, alerts that people on your Twitter account are nearby, the location of celestial bodies and dip in broad daylight, and even the location of a recent robbery. Whether this constitutes a practical use of less reality or a practical use of more reality, I think that's kind of an empirical question. But what's clear is these sorts of ubiquitous and embedded technological mediations are increasingly com are becoming an increasingly common feature of everyday reality. 
and they deeply blur what counts as paramount or the primary reality at any given moment. These mediations become less and less detectable, and then we become increasingly, it becomes increasingly unclear which sort of reality the people around you happen to be engaged in. So I thought about this as, you know, we think we have problems with students getting distracted by Facebook now, right? They're wearing it this context. All right, so here there, Berger and Luckman depart from their fairly, the fairly, I think, poker-faced prose of score to strike a more populist chord. For example, in the section on society as objective reality, they write with more passion. They state all social reality is precarious. All societies are constructions in the face of chaos. The constant possibility of a gnomic terror is actualized whenever the legitimations that obscure the precariousness are threatened. This suggests in point of fact, then, that the paramount reality that we typically take for granted is but a fabricated dream state. Legitimations serving stability and coherence restrain this repressed chaos. This provides, I think, a good place for me to conclude. One thing I'd like to point out is I'm not trying to minimize how consumerism, capitalism, institutional domination, false consciousness, or any other pernicious aspect of contemporary social life is trying to infiltrate our subjective experience of society. And it's certainly the case that we don't get to reinvent the rules every time we play the game. And it's also the case that it's easier to go along with the program when we're relatively safe, warm, well-fed. However, it strikes me that there's this interstitial zone of reality we all enter and leave as a matter of course. Ceremonies like bar mitzvahs, weddings, funerals make the beginnings and endings of these kinds of reality oscillations readily apparent. But as the ethnomethodologists have all pointed out, daily life is an intricate tapestry of informal rituals and rites of transition that also have identifiable openings and closings. They're present, but only when we look closely. So our routine oscillations between spheres of reality typically go unnoticed. They don't induce a gnomic terror. They rarely make obvious that all societies are constructions in the face of chaos. What they do instead is offer a little slack in our pre-programmed lives. My main argument is that we live in a precarious state of less reality just as much as, if not more so, that we live with the full weight of the world pressing down on our shoulders. These are places where we play with what reality is, what it might become. They provide opportunities then to incorporate traces of our play, for good or for evil, into our sometimes all too serious lives. Thank you. <laughs>